right. Good evening, everybody. I just changed my view to speaker. Good evening, everybody. Uh, this is Neve Shaw here, the science communicator in residence for the Abbey Leaks Climate Action Plan. And I'm back on screen again because it's Wednesday night and we continue our new approaches to uh, climate change speaker series. And I'm so excited uh, that we have our, our speaker with us tonight. And uh, I can't believe that we've managed to secure Sally Weintraub, to be honest with you, because she was on our wish list when uh, myself and, and Catherine, Catherine joins us tonight from uh, the Leash Heritage Forum. How are you, Catherine? Are you good tonight? Are you good? I'm great tonight. Yep. Thanks very much. Great. Nice. Yeah. Great Kath to be here. Great to have Sally with us. It is. And, and uh, Catherine, as ever, is going to be moderating uh, questions and comments that you have from Facebook Live. But we have Sally Weintraub with us tonight, who's a, a psychoanalyst. And when we were putting together our wish list of people that we could possibly get to speak to the community about new approaches to climate change, we said, sure, look, we'll send an email and we'll see what happens. And I don't know, I don't know how, but Sally has very kindly uh, decided to give us um, some of her time tonight. So, so Sally, I, I'll just say hello to you. How are you tonight, Sally? And thank you so much for joining us. I'm very pleased to be with everybody. Yeah, oh, so lovely. And where are you? Where are you tonight now? Which, which are you in England? I'm in London. You're in London. And, Great. Uh, I would love to be there with you. Know. And yeah. you know, although I'm aware that some people aren't necessarily all in the same place. It's lovely to, you know, to think of uh, Abbey Leaks and to think of you there. And I hope one day to visit. Yeah. Oh, that would be terrific. That would be terrific. And, and thank you so much again for, for taking the time to, to share your insights tonight with us. So um, what's going to happen tonight is uh, it's lovely is that Sally doesn't use slides. She has prepared a, a talk for us, which she's going to deliver. And then we'll get a chance then to um, speak to Sally afterwards. So there's a few things. Uh, I just want to tell you a little bit about Sally and tell her about her book and a special discount code that she has for her new book, which you can avail of. But we actually have a prize tonight of two books, uh, don't we, Catherine? Um, sort of for the best question or the best comment, really, don't we? <laughs> or the most interesting comment or the most wacky comment, I suppose. Yeah, <laughs> Stump we the want speaker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so speaker. So, so we have two copies of her book, which is Psychological Roots of the Climate Crisis, and it comes out on April the 8th. So, but you can pre order now from her website, sallyweintrobe.com, and her surname is spelled W E I N T R O B E.com. Maybe you could put it in the comment there, um, actually, Catherine. So, yeah. Sally, anyway, just for those of you who are unaware of her work, um, she's a psychoanalyst and she and writes and talks about how we can understand what underlies our, underlies our widespread disavowal of the climate crisis. She is a fellow of the British Psychoanalytical Society and a founding member of the Climate Psychology Alliance and chair of the International Psychoanalytical Association on Climate Committee. And her latest book, as I said, Psychological Roots of the Climate Crisis, is available from April the 8th. And you can get a special discount for individuals on her website, sallyweintrobe.com. And uh, I am delighted to be here in my capacity as the science communicator in residence for the Abbey Leaks Climate Action Plan, which of course is an initiative from Creative Leash, Leash County Council Midland Science with the Abbey Leaks Tid Tidy Towns in, in partnership. So so Sally, where, where shall we begin? Uh, what would you, would you like to just get right into it? Or do you want to have a wee chat beforehand? Or what, what would you like to do first? I think I'd like to get into it. So that okay. we'll have time for as much time as we can. I'm, okay. I'm afraid I'm using up too much of our time with what I'm going to say. So, you know, I, I would love to have time at the end for questions, okay. comments, observations, and so on. Yeah. Lovely. Okay, right. Well, uh, we are absolutely thrilled to have you. So in your own time. Great. Okay. So what I'm going to do is, uh, it, it, this usually works with webinars. I'm actually going to read a talk mm. and I'm going to pull it up. So I'll be seeing my screen. If anything goes wrong, give me a shout. <laughs> I will do. Don't worry. So, I will. You know, yeah. Okay. So here we are. So I want to thank you very much, Neve, uh, for inviting me to be part of this joint community initiative on engaging with climate change. And I did see that Catherine Casey um, described Neve's involvement as, and I'm quoting, helping us to bring the community together to engage with climate change in a new way. Uh, and I love this description uh, because I believe uh, taking in the reality about climate is difficult and it's best achieved together in groups. That's why I love that this project is grounded in a community, um, in Abbey Leaks community. So getting going, uh, well, first of all, 
The climate crisis is much too large a subject to cover in just one talk, so I will pick up a few strands to begin a discussion. But first, I want to give some context for what I'm going to say. Now, as we know, people currently are facing multiple threats to survival. The pandemic, an economic crisis, a climate and environmental crisis, and the social fabric in danger of unraveling. These crises are interwoven and they stem from the destructive way that we are treating planet Earth and nature. All of them. The viral pandemic brought along with it an anxiety pandemic. However, I see this anxiety pandemic as touching on existential anxiety uh, that is currently deeper even than anxieties about COVID, about economics and about the social fabric. I suggest many people are experiencing existential anxiety about the damaged state of the climate and the environment. They know, even while keeping their knowledge largely, many of them, largely out of their conscious awareness, that they depend utterly on what nature provides. People often place climate change at the bottom of their list of things to worry about. And let's face it, there is plenty to worry about uh, at any one moment. And these things are also driven by the media um, or amplified often by the media. There's the COVID crisis, the economy, the state of politics. It's as though there's a fantasy that when somehow, when all these other problems have been sort of solved, in quotes, then we will attend to the climate. And this is precisely the wrong way around. Because as I've said, the climate crisis is driving all the other crises. Deep down, people do uh, know this and they're feeling highly anxious about it. And uh, the anxiety can be so acute, it's been described as existential. It's about very survival. I want to suggest that what we see is people trying to manage their anxiety in two sorts of ways. One by hovering uh, above it and experiencing too little anxiety, and the other by experiencing too much anxiety. Now, a word about anxiety. Anxiety is actually our inner alarm call. It lets us know when we need to act and how fast we need to act. There's nothing wrong with anxiety. And climate anxiety is actually a healthy response to the current situation. Now, experiencing too little anxiety is maladaptive. Experiencing too much anxiety can have complex strands to it. On the one hand, seeing the degree of environmental devastation that has already occurred can feel quite overwhelming. And when people feel overwhelmed, they need to protect themselves from that. On the other hand, oh, it's just all too much. Best think about something else. That can be a way of more actively keeping oneself dissociated from one's concern. That means split off from, putting it somewhere over there, disassociated. Uh, and that can also be a way of trying to deal with uh, feeling overwhelmed. It, it can become part of denial itself. Now to explore why climate change is by now so hard to think about, I need to introduce the idea of bubbles. A bubble, as I'm using it, is a collective retreat from reality. It's a psychic, it's a psychological state of affairs in which one creates a world that's cut off from reality. Bubbles are largely socially constructed. Uh, my subject is the climate bubble. And I argue that it's designed to minimize our moral unease that we would feel if we were to step out of the bubble and see the real world clearly. The climate bubble is kept inflated through often subtle cultural pressure to collude with slippery, corrupting arguments. 
and the world seen from inside the bubble is a virtual as if fake world. It has all the difficulty and the responsibility taken out of it. It's a prettified world. Unsustainable behavior is thought of as normal and usual, indeed the only way. Inside the bubble, people can act without seeing the need to count the true cost. And the mechanisms that preserve the bubble are largely maintained by unconscious group pressures. People in the bubble are largely unaware of this. They're drawn into the bubble. The climate bubble has been seeded, inflated, and then maintained largely through what I've called a culture of uncare. And by that, I mean a culture with a perverse aim. The aim is to encourage people to disassociate or distance themselves from the part of them that does care and is socially responsible. The culture of uncare actively seeks to boost people's wishful uh, and apparently all powerful side and thus it kind of infantilizes them and regresses them psychologically. In my book that's coming out in April, I argue that neoliberalism's culture of uncare, it's our current global political dominant system, I argue that neoliberalism's culture of uncare, which includes advertising, media, political propaganda and social group pressure, a very important part of it, the social group pressure, uh, works to undermine being caring and taking responsibility. I'm very sorry I can't go into this, uh, you know, that would take another lecture, but it's fascinating. And so by the culture of uncare, I mean it actively seeks to uncare us. The culture of uncare is designed to make ignoring others and future generations seem not a problem. And that has suited the needs of a deregulated neoliberal economy that puts uh, short-term profits first and, and encourages consumption. Now the climate bubble is just one of a whole number of bubbles, but it's by far, it's far larger and far more damaging and far more consequential than any bubble in human history. It has involved planning to extract all for now for the few with storms and instability for the rest. The climate bubble has served a particular sanitizing psychological function, which is to bleach violence, death and suffering from the picture. And this bubble is now bursting. It must burst, all bubbles burst, as it's based on omnipotent magical thinking. It's not rooted in reality-based thinking. The damage and the suffering caused by this bubble are now too huge to conceal. It must burst uh, because reality is, is, is intervening and becoming obvious to everyone. One sign of the climate bubble bursting is that more people are talking openly about the state of the climate. The psychoanalyst Hannah Siegel argued, she was talking about the nuclear issue actually, but she argued that staying silent is the real crime. And I would add, that social silence about climate has kept this bubble afloat long enough for the resulting damage to be staggering, as we know. Now that the climate bubble is bursting, very broadly speaking, people are either trying to stay in the bubble with further denial, or they're struggling to face reality. And of course, many people and many of us veer between the two. Inside the bubble, people believe that they are in the privileged group entitled to be saved. Why? Because they're special and worth it. It's the others who are going to be sacrificed. And I call this phenomenon Noah's Arkism. Uh, I think you can pick up the imagery. There's much to say about Noah's Arkism, but I want to concentrate instead not on staying in the bubble, but the difficulties of trying to face reality when coming out of the bubble. Many of us are trying to cope with the shock of emerging from the climate bubble 
and trying to stay sane while facing climate reality today when so much damage to our life support systems has already been done and some of it is irreparable. This is very hard. How do we face climate reality? And crucially, how do we stay with difficult feelings so our understanding is not just, what I mean is stay with the feelings so that our understanding is not just temporary and flash in the pan? Psychoanalysis calls this working through our feelings and staying with them in our conflicts. Sorry, psychoanalysis calls this process of working through. Uh, it's working through our feelings and our conflicts. And of course, working through is an ongoing process. I believe we first need to appreciate the fact that we face not one or a few, but a whole series of shocks. The first being that climate news is itself shocking. Global warming has largely happened during the last 40 years. It's neoliberalism's legacy, and that is shocking. But more shocking is that very recently, as we know, warming has started to speed up. As I said earlier, the problem with climate reality is we tend to feel either too much or too little about it, veering between shock, uh, too much, and disavowal. That's the kind of denial where we minimize reality or we make it meaningless to us, which is very dangerous, actually. And neither state, the too much or the too little, helps us to think rationally. And by thinking rationally, I mean thinking that includes our feelings and our bodily reactions. In addition to shock at the news itself, people are likely to feel assaulted by feelings uh, that being in the bubble protected them from. Shame, once unconsciously shared out amongst members of the group, may suddenly feel particularly acute. When I heard about the vast number of animals who died in the Australian bushfires recently, I actually felt ashamed to be a member of my own species. Some feelings released will be melancholic and potentially paralyzing. Others, while very painful, are lively and part of grieving. And let's not forget uh, that we only grieve uh, what we love. Uh, and if we love our planet and we love and value things about nature, why wouldn't we be grieving? A further shock is realizing more clearly that most leaders currently in power are continuing with policies leading to ecocide despite their words. This means that in effect, they do not care if people live or die. Surely our leaders can't be that collectively crazy. And knowing that they still are is very hard to bear. And by crazy, I don't mean individually psychopathic. I mean, they're caught up in a, a political system that renders them crazy. Then we're no longer in the climate bubble. We have radically to reevaluate our sense of ourselves we see that we're vulnerable and unprotected when we thought, we may have thought we were invincible. Death suddenly feels closer and more real. We see how easily seducible we are and how prey to colluding with corrupting politi political propaganda designed to support continuing with business as usual. And we may feel shocked that we allowed ourselves to be duped. At the same time, it's also deeply replenishing to emerge from a bubble, which is in effect a collective psychic retreat from reality. When we emerge, we see the real picture more clearly. Stepping out of the bubble enables us to see strength and beauty in the interconnected systems that support life, and also to see the fragility in those systems and the moral imperative for humans to respect their limits in the way that they live their lives. With this background, my question is, how do we work through the environmental tragedy unfolding and stay sane? We need to find these answers together. For my part, these days I read as much environmental news as possible, but never before writing or sleeping, as I find it too disturbing and it makes me anxious, and I'm not alone. Many people are reporting eco-anxiety, which, unless it's crippling, is on the side of life, as I said, it's care's alarm call to face reality and to act. Then we may be feeling traumatized by climate news. Trauma can overwhelm the capacity to think clearly. 
it can leave people struggling with feeling over and underwhelmed by the traumatizing events. Traumatized people can find it harder to judge whom is to blame with any sense of proportion, and they're prone to disassociate from the traumatizing event. I've found studying war trauma in soldiers very helpful in thinking about potential climate trauma. First of all, there's post-traumatic stress disorder, which we know as PTSD. This is when one's sense of safety has been traumatically shattered and one may constantly re relive the trauma in the present, feeling that danger may strike again at any moment, and this is called hyperarousal. Many PTSD sufferers eventually convert their hyperarousal into hyperconstriction, where all emotion, even pleasure, is toned down and experiences are avoided that might evoke any feelings of threat. So to what extent are many of us hypervigilantly on the lookout for climate information and using hyperconstriction to shut it out? Because this could be a way to protect our hearts and minds from overwhelm in traumatizing conditions. Then there's pre-traumatic pre stress disorder. That's the trauma that soldiers suffer in prolonged situations of helpless anticipation of a future traumatizing event like climate breakdown. The psychiatrist, Lise van Susteren, sees our stress at anticipating and pending climate breakdown as a form of pre-traumatic stress disorder. And of course, right now, People across the world and climate refugees are already exp experiencing traumatic climate events. Their situations worsened by COVID-19 and the added economic hardship it brings. When a journalist asked me, how do we tell people about the climate emergency without traumatizing them? I said, it's not easy to know how, but I firmly believe that what matters is whether we give truthful pictures about the future in a caring way, not in a careless, switched off way that does not relate to how people might be feeling. I heard a child say, mummy school told us today that the world is about to end, is that true? And her parent answered, of course it's not true, and immediately changed the subject. I suggest that bald answer, while true in a, tr in a strict sense, abandoned the child and delegitimized the child's voice and concern. While rage, especially rage at injustice, feeling dismissed and not respected, can fuel the world to act for the better, it can also be part of a trauma reaction, in which case it's more likely to be loveless and tending towards hate acts repetitive, destructive grievance, and identifying with the ones who are traumatizing, with the traumatizers, which is why we need to pay close attention to whether we're feeling traumatized. I now turn to moral injury, and uh, the violation of our sen sense of what's right. Studying stories of morally injured soldiers reveals this pattern. A sense of betrayal by a leadership that idealized the view and hid the truth, that lied, that devalued life and was casual about killing. The helplessness of feeling caught up in a vast machine that prevents one from acting with care and conscience. The collapse of one's inner ideals. Feeling one's own experience and sense of reality is just brushed aside and does not count. Now, this could be a description of what many people now report feeling about the economic and political world in which they live, one that inevitably generates a climate crisis. The global economy now structures how people live in ways that conflict with their ordinary human decency. Daily life, for the more affluent, is fraught with moral dilemmas. Do I take the car or the bus or the bike? Do I buy that book online from a company that employs people on zero hours contracts? What do I do when nearly everything I buy comes wrapped up in plastic? My very way of living causes environmental and social damage. How do I live with the guilt and shame of my participation? Suffering moral injury is a sign of mental health, not disorder. It means that one's conscience is alive. 
Staunching and repairing moral injury involve psychic work, psychological work, facing remorse, seeking forgiveness, gaining new understanding of one's own individual culpability, and being able to place that in a wider context. And it's in these ways that one's shattered ideals can be rebuilt and what's right, refound amidst scars. Judith Herman, who studied survivors of trauma, is one of a number who've argued that social action serves as the strongest antidote to traumatic experience. It creates, quotes, an alliance with others based on cooperation and shared purpose. I believe breaking with our current culture of uncare requires a collective effort of working through grief, remorse, and a reshouldering of collective responsibility. And it matters greatly that this is undertaken in a spirit of forgiveness of self and other. The real tragedy with the climate bubble is that it allowed so much damage to accrue that facing climate reality now can feel unbearable. And what I do know from my own experience is that trying to bear it and allowing myself to feel at times overwhelmed helps me better contain my distress and soften my rage. I find that I'm more reflective and sadder, knowing I too profited from ignoring nature's limits and colluded with the culture that worked to uncare me and us. I think we need to find ways collectively to work these sorts of feelings through together. Coming towards the end, I want to read you parts of a poem by a young North American poet, Mia Nelson, about how the climate crisis leaves her feeling. Um, I'm only reading parts of her poem. Uh, it's called, You Call It Eco Trauma. Wendell Berry called it the peace of wild things, but really it was the ending of things that we saw no ending to, our feet standing on the sweet glacial edge of heaven. I call it waking up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat and knowing your mother is being killed in the next room and not being able to move. I call it crying every birthday since I was 10, knowing nothing can save me, us, it, ours from time. It's funny, the only thing that can really save me is dark soil and waterfalls and sun, suddenly the moment you can see everything around you when it finally becomes obvious. Nothing this still and clear and God-bred could belong to anyone who speaks our greedy language of want. I want to highlight the lines, I call it waking up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat and knowing your mother is being killed in the next room but not being able to move. These words speak to me of one young person struggling to work through and to bear irreparable damage. The damage here might be earth being gradually killed by ecocide. It might also refer to such disassociation that we no longer hear children's cries, even our own children's. We do hear them and we are moved, but are we moved to the point where we're prepared to give up any privilege and make sacrifices for the next generation and room for them? Inside the climate bubble, this acute conflict is deadened and our caring part is disassociated from. And might this bubble-like dead in state also be the dead mother Mia is referring to? In my experience, children and young people, including young adults, are often much more in touch with climate reality than their elders. They know they are the generation who will have to live in a world in which the elders allocated them so little entitlement. When Mia says, you call it eco-trauma, I call it knowing your mother is being killed in the next room, might she be speaking of a form of deafness that allows one group to leave all the suffering to be felt by another group? I believe neoliberalism's culture of uncare's most deadly appeal has been in its seductive promise that people can apparently dispense with inner moral struggle between what we may wish for and what is sustainable. However, to transition to a sustainable way of living, 
people need to stay with that conflict between what we wish for and what's sustainable uh, and consider Earth in every single thing we do. When we believe we're entitled to be spared the hassle of caring, we treat the lively reality-seeking part of ourselves as unimportant. We undermine its willpower. The most treacherous fake promise offered by neoliberalism's self-serving dominant culture of uncare is return to the bubble and you can be spared in a discomfort. Then we fall prey to the deadly fantasy that the pain of living can be avoided. The danger is that if the fossil fuel age is not ended very soon now and sections of humanity do not bring rampant greed and injustice under control, reality will become ever more unbearable and overwhelming and people may increasingly be tempted to defend against too much uh, emotional pain with the too little uh, psychic defense. Thank you. I've reached the end. Thank you so much, Sonny. Gosh, that's um, there's a lot to think about in that. That's that's incredible. And you know, I think it really it really hits uh, when you're talking about that the bubble, and you're you're putting words around states of confusion that I actually understand. I I. I it's lovely for it to be formalized and for it to be compared to other experiences or other areas that we've had in our life. Um, how did you how did you figure that out? How did you start to look at that and find that those lang that those language of terms around it? How did you how did you how did you do well, that? <laughs> well, it comes from it comes from. Um, I mean, my training is as a psychoanalyst and uh, a psychoanalyst called John Steiner put forward a really useful idea, I think. He was talking about individuals, but he talked about something called a psychic retreat, hmm. which is, it, it, it is a sort of a bubble. It's where you, uh, it, it's, it's based on denial, where uh, it's a means of trying to cope with uh, unmanageable anxiety. Yeah. So you kind of, deaden your awareness of reality and you don't let it get through and it's you know the thing about bubbles is they're actually fragile as well mm. you know um yeah. they they uh, protect us uh uh from feeling too fragile so they're based on illusion yeah uh so partly the idea came from there and then i thought you know what it's not just for individuals there are collective psychic retreats uh, social groups, uh, you know, you can you can have a social group that, that you start thinking its main unconscious task is to stop anybody talking about climate change. That's it. Yeah. Part, you yeah. Know? yeah. So, and then the bubble, the word bubble came because when I started studying um, other bubbles and economic bubbles, um, uh, you get large groups of people caught up in denial. The financial crisis was another bubble. Mm, mm. Okay. And uh, people who are inside the bubble, um, they do and they don't see the reality. Mm, mm. And it requires a lot of collusion with large groups. You know, you need, with the financial bubble, you need uh, rating agencies saying that all those mortgages were triple A rated. You need a whole sort of social machine to come together to support a bubble. Yeah. You need a culture that supports it. Um, and bubbles serve very useful economic ends. People make a lot of profits out of bubbles. So I thought, okay, so now this is the climate bubble. Yeah. And yeah. it's much bigger than any of the other bubbles, you know. I mean, another, another example of a bubble would be the, the VW scandal. That was a bubble. Yeah. Um, vast numbers of people all sort of come together <clears throat> as a group to disavow a piece of cheating. And of course, fraud is involved with bubbles. Mm, mm, mm. And to be hard hitting about it, it's a fraudulent arrangement that we are arranging to deprive our next generations of a future by yeah. the way we're living our lives. Yeah. We're perpetrating a fraud on them. And when it bursts, they'll be the ones who pick up the pieces. So 
Yeah. It's you know, just, it's, it's so it all arose, those sort of ideas yeah. coming together. Sorry. Yeah. It's, it is such an overwhelming topic and you're right. It, it is something, uh, what I really like about the bubble, it kind of explains that what you just said is that, you know, but sometimes it's just so overwhelming. It's safer to stay in the bubble and pretend that none of this is happening and thinking, oh, it's going to, it's happening somewhere else. I, I don't really have to worry about it. And what really hit hard when you said, you know, those, those dilemmas that you have about, should I take the car? If I order online, you know, there's delivery here. And it's so difficult for people to live in another way. I, I often think that that's what, that's what kind of, um, it, it, why people are reluctant to see it for what it truly is because we haven't yet figured out uh, the pathway for us to live on a daily basis more sustainably rather than making really strong choices in our lives to go outside, uh, to go above and beyond what's required and to stand outside of our social group. But the only way we can tackle this is that if a better way of, of living more sustainably becomes the norm. And that can't come from the individual. It has to always come from, from higher authorities. So, so sometimes that's just too much, isn't it? Well, I think we're also going to have to confront higher authorities, you know, yeah. who are not stepping up. And uh, what impresses me is that, you know, ordinary people, um, what they want doesn't feature a lot of the time. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I remember, um, I remember the Women's Institute years and years ago when the, when plastic and packaging first became an issue. They were outraged. They went to the tills and they took off all the packaging and they left mm -hmm. it there. They protested and protested, and then it kind of dies down because the powers that be, uh, yeah. actually, things are arranged in a way that it suits them to have that packaging and yeah. plastic. You know, um, yeah. so it's, you know, and that's why also um, so much has been kept obscure about you maintain a bubble by you don't tell people what's really going on, you know. Yeah, yeah. What conditions are like in Amazon work, uh, you know, factories and things, distribution depots and so on. You, 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 you manufacture a rather idealised world. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, so it is hard to live that's why I think moral injury is such a useful idea. Yeah. Uh, you know, we can't just step outside of these things. But, but hopefully, if we get to understand mm -hmm. how politics is driving things and how, how, and how power is driving things against what many people actually want, um, we might be able to um, push for change. Yeah. yeah. You know, and live in a different way. This yeah. is what, this is what uh, the task is now, it seems to me. Well, and having I think understanding these things helps it. us too. Yeah, it does. But what you've just said is really it really helpful because you're giving a language around something that to me has always felt intangible. The guilt, the guilt is a thing, and and you're right. I think our younger generations really feel that responsibility. I mean, Greta Thunberg is a perfect example of somebody that I think represents a lot of people at at her um, in her generation who feel overwhelmed and just won't take it anymore. And but your analysis of it makes it more tangible and and you're validating the feelings that I think I know I recognize and I'm sure many of us uh, listening tonight will recognize um before I go into my whole uh, you know continued conversation let me just check in with Catherine and see what kind of um in interaction we're getting from um the uh, the comment section don't forget guys they, we have two books available um to give away tonight and um, if you engage in the conversation and from what the, from what we've just heard from Sally I mean I'm definitely getting a copy of it. Catherine, what's what's happening out there? Well, we've got a good few comments and um, people are very moved by what Sally yeah. said. One question, Jack B says, a really great perspective on these issues and on the impact of neoliberalism. I'm wondering if she will mention Zizek's writings on climate change. I'm not sure if I've, I've pronounced that right. Is that the, somebody the what, that... Sorry? Zizek's writings, Zizek's writings on climate change? Yes, Zizek. Um, not, not particularly, actually. Not particularly. Has, has the, I, the, the trouble is, I wish I could have a conversation with you and ask I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> you asked that question or the Chris, you know, the person who asked that. She's um, just wondering if you'd mentioned it. This was early on in the talk. She was wondering if it was something you were going to touch on. No, um, I will look. I, 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 I know of Zizek, but I will look it up, specifically what he's saying about climate. Yeah, thank you. Okay. 
Um, Neve then has mentioned something that you said earlier. I'm not sure was it before we started or or, or at the start of the talk. Um, talking about resilient communities, she says I think that one strategy is to work to create resilient communities now, so that we have some social tools, the ability to cooperate, negotiate, co-create, if we don't yet have the full range of tools to meet climate change. So that's sort of a comment on on I suppose the building of community. Yeah, that um, is true. Because also, you know, we've we've uh, we've had a lot of um, undermining of community, haven't we? We're, mm. our, our culture, the culture of uncare, is an individualizing, alienating culture, and so I think we have a lot of repair to do. And building community is also um, repair work. I think communities, you know, even in my lifetime, I've seen uh, a loss of community help to manage the difficult things of life. Mm. And in a way, what I'm talking about is the difficult side of things that we don't necessarily talk about enough or, you know, but we feel them, you know, so that for instance, um, community has rituals mm. uh, that help you mourn, mm -hmm. uh, that help you appreciate the seasons passing, uh, you know, that, um, uh, yeah, I think I think they're fundamentally important and building them up helps us face reality, basically. Yeah, yeah, and certainly I, I know from working with the Abbey Leaks community, I think that's something yeah. that definitely has helped, um, you know, I think engage more in in doing things on the ground in uh, climate action. I mean, I've seen it firsthand and I do think that once you have enough people who are prepared to work together, then things can happen. And I do think it does ease that sense of anxiety because we can't change the world, but maybe we can change a patch of the world, one group or one community at a time. Well, I think that there are, um, I don't know if we're going to be able to change the world. <laughs> <It's just not laughs> I'm a terrible optimist, uh, Sally. <laughs> but you know, actually at the moment, we're seeing some very interesting uprisings of or, you know different groups of people, Extinction Rebellion, mm, school kids, yeah. Black Lives Matter, Me mm. Too, and you know each one of those groupings is about something different uh, and has its own unique history. But they're all saying we want to live, we want respect, mm -hmm. things have to be sustainable. I, I'd include the Parkland, uh, you know, March for Our Lives, the American school kids marching against being shot in their classrooms. Mm. They're all saying enough violence, you know, um, uh, th there's deep-seated protests going on and so and I think it's very very widespread yeah and uh, you know um, I think that that we need to sort of be, find our way in forging caring values we need we need a culture of care yeah. so that you know this very dangerous moment uh, we can we can contain the destructiveness through care not not have it you know the situation get more fractured yeah. So I think I think there is a, a very big upsurging of care at the moment, actually. Mm -hmm. Anything else, Catherine? Well, actually, just as, as Sally says that, Robbie from Abbey Leaks um, is kind of reflecting a similar, a similar emotion, I suppose. He says, as a community, we can raise awareness, we can open it up to people from the bottom up mm -hmm. and make a small difference that will hopefully feed into a bigger change. So that's sort of reflecting what, what you were saying. Um, Mary is asked, can the video be sent to all politicians? So we'll yes. certainly do our best to get it out <laughs> as widely as we yeah. possibly can. Yeah. Quite a few people have said that they've ordered your book, so that's good news. There you go, Sally. There you go. I'm not um, surprised. I wanted just, could Joanna had an interesting comment, which kind of reflected some of my emotion as I was listening, actually. She says, an excellent lecture explains the intense emotions associated with climate issues and some insight into the mass denial and avoidance we see. We have to continue to try and improve this world, but it's overwhelming at times. It would take brave people to make a stand. So I think yeah. possibly I, what I was thinking was just identifying that, at least identifying that feeling of overwhelm sometimes mm. can maybe help us to move forward. Mm. And some of what I took from what you were saying, it sounds like Joanna's saying something similar. And you yeah. know, if we, if we face reality as it is now, why wouldn't we be feeling overwhelmed? Yeah. It, it, yeah. It's, it's the emotion that's um, dignified enough to meet the situation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're not feeling overwhelmed from time to time. Actually, you know, I think there's something the matter. You're not you're not seeing it straight. But the other thing is it doesn't I, in my experience, it doesn't last. 
you feel overwhelmed and then you pick yourself up and then the next day it's feeling a bit different and uh, it really helps to talk to people about it um you know and also yeah. i think we have to realize that you know people are in different places so that we might feel overwhelmed but somebody else might might need to protect their hearts in different ways that day you know we have to be we have to be um recognize each other's fragility and give each other space uh but but help each other yeah yeah and i think that the guilt is the you know i go back to soldiers i spent it, i've spent a lot of time watching soldiers reading about them because i think i think they learn a lot they they carry a lot of guilt actually and the the, the sight of seeing soldiers with their arms around each other you know actually talking about their sense of moral injury is very moving you know uh and they do it with their arms around each other to help each other you know and uh, so i've taken a lot of inspiration from soldiers uh who wake up to you know and and try and process uh what is unbearable guilt and isn't it funny we live in a guiltless apparently we're all guiltless because in the bubble we experience no guilt but actually i think we're all struggling with it yeah i think we know i i always think of um i i I remember seeing that episode of of Blue Planet when, you know, they did the environmental episode. And I just remember just feeling ill, just feeling sick and just like not actually being able to articulate even what I was feeling, but just feeling this shame, uh, guilt, sadness, but then needing to just step away because it was it was actually almost too much. And so what's really great about what you've shared with us tonight, Sally, is that you've given us the tools to understand what those feelings mean and that they're normal. And that, as you say, they're an alarm that we're not, we're not actually fundamentally happy with the way, with the way things are going. So yeah. Um, yeah. Catherine, is there anything else? Cause I could, I could ask loads of questions of Sally. Well, I was I just, just want to follow, make sure. following on from that. And what, what yeah. I was just taking on from your point there, that those feelings are, are, normal uh, but also that they're important to feel yeah. them not not to try and get away from them yeah. and that's i think sometimes what we face when we're trying to get to engage communities with climate action or sometimes people feel as though you're hitting them over the head with it so the, the trick is to try and engage people with the sense of overwhelm allow them to feel it and work through it together rather than this feeling of, of i feel guilty so i'm going to try and make you feel guilty which just makes people defensive and <laughs> gets nowhere there are two things I'd say to that. The, the, I'll probably forget the second one by the time I get to it. <laughs> no, I've forgotten the first. Um, what were you talking about? Hitting over? Yes. I remember writing one section. I refer to it actually this in the, um, the introduction where I started saying everything that's wrong, you know, and there's this and there's that. And, and eventually I thought, you know, the point is I'm feeling uncontained. Mm. And uh, it's like I've become, you know, that thing, chicken little running around saying the world, the, the sky's falling. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Going. So I just, I just highlighted the whole thing and I pressed delete. Because my point being that I think uh, as communicators about climate and as, um, and as living with the problem and, fa- and staying in touch with reality, uh, I think that we need to sort of really process very difficult feelings because it's only when we process them ourselves that we don't do what you said we don't uh hit other people over the head with them because when we do that what we're actually trying to do is get rid of them into the other people yeah okay mm-hmm. mm-hmm. people recognize that could, you know and stir yeah. them up then we can feel better uh so i think it's 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 incredibly important to realize just that we've actually created a world that's, I believe, is not really possible to live with psychologically. We shouldn't be having to live with this degree of malfunction and damage. This is, why would we think that this is okay psychologically? It's not, you know. And I want to add something else, which is that, you know, it's, it's, I find it's very helpful to get a sense of proportion I don't know if, how many of you have come across this, the, the, the term ecocide. Have you been discussing ecocide? Not yet. Yeah. No, we might pursue it. Yep. 
Well, I think it's very important. Um, Ecoside, this lawyer, Polly Higgins, um, she tragically died of cancer a couple of years ago, but she spent her time uh, arguing that ecocide is, is, is made a law, uh, just like genocide in the, in the criminal court. And, and, and so that uh, governments and uh, lead uh, the carbon major polluters and, and you know, uh, companies that are causing ecocide. Ecocide is the death of planetary, you know, uh, Earth systems. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that they are actually criminally accountable. So there'll be a law of ecocide and it's, it's becoming talked about now. But I think it's a mental health measure that, that mm. we could have because when you've got, if we had a law of ecocide, um, then uh, uh, ordinary people would not be feel so guilty. They'd be able to see the whole thing in a kind of perspective, you know, that there are certain companies who are driving ecocide actually. Um, chopping down rainforests for, you know, I mean, all these massive things that are going on. And, uh, and if it was against the law, uh, first of all, it would curtail that, but it would also help ordinary people to think, well, yes, you know, I'm a bit responsible, a little bit, but I'm not as responsible as, you know, um, the CEO of Exxon, who it's been proved, no, have known for decades about climate change. You know, so I think that would help enormously. And there's a very big fight going on. It's quite interesting website. If you look up Ecoside, there's an Ecoside website for anyone who's interested just to follow it more, you know. And, and as a community, you know, because that's what we are essentially, um, having distilled this, uh, these tools that can kind of give, give language about how we're feeling, how how can we better support each other like what Catherine is saying is you know the initial thing is like oh god you know so are you saying that we should approach with a with more of a of a care of a care kind of a culture instead well I don't think people see you Catherine Catherine has to go so thanks very oh, much Catherine I, I'll finish up so here thank, thank you so you. much to meet you. So and much. we'll pick thanks, two Sally. winners we'll go, I'll go talk to Catherine later we'll pick two winners um off off Sally's book um after this chat ends but I, yeah, I'm going to both... take I'm going to take it home now and finish with with Sally thanks Catherine um yeah how do we uh yeah as so, so looking at Abneeks then giving us those tools so rather than beating people up, you know, with with the facts about climate change, what is a better approach, Sally? I know I'm asking you for the impossible answer, but it is a bit impossible. Um, and I, I, I'm very, very sorry that, you know, I can't relate to the group. Mm. People who are listening to this, asking questions on chat, I can't relate to you in person. Such a shame, because then we could I could find out what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think it's better to sort of get involved with um, uh that sort of question in a context actually mm, mm, mm. um i but think it's from a... can do something and i do i do think that talking about climate and talking about how how people are feeling in in a, in a way that feels safe is is actually a very important thing yeah because otherwise we're all we're all thinking about it or avoiding thinking about it which is actually can be dangerous because we need mm. to be thinking about it by ourselves, you know. Um. But yeah, yeah. Wow, it's been a fascinating discussion. I mean, you know, before before we started, uh, what what I really like about your work is it kind of mirrors. Um, I think, you know, like looking at the planet differently is it, for me is that I think as a species, we tend to think we're in charge, but we're really not in charge. We're part of a, we're part of, we're part of a system. And as, as humans, we keep thinking that we can control it, but we, but we can't. And now we're kind of bearing the brunt of the consequences of, of kind of taking that to its entity and, and, and now we have to deal with the, with the issues, but, um, Sally, thank you very, very much for tonight's discussion. I, I will definitely have you back around the time that your book is launched and maybe we'll we'll have a further chat about it. But your book is um your book is just to call it again, it's the it's the psychological roots of the climate crisis. We have two winners from tonight's discussion um that we'll be giving this out to, but uh I think your work is really essential. I've never heard anyone talk about climate change from this perspective and 
I can't even articulate what I've heard. I need to sit back and kind of digest it. But it's been really, really valuable to hear the emotions being legitimized like that and to give structure around it. So um, I guess I'll, I'll ask you to give one last nugget of advice based on your 15 years of exploration of this topic that you would give to the people tuning in tonight. Well, um, I, I like what you said just now, uh, the bit where you said um, you didn't know how to articulate it, but you'd stay with it. Mm. Because I think, um, I think it's, um, it's hard to take in. It takes time. Um, this is a different kind of understanding that is very sympathetic to us, you know, as uh, thinking and also feeling beings with subjectivity and we need to take things in uh, and, and we take them in slowly. And, you know, so I very much liked what you said there. Okay. Um, uh, thank you everybody for being here. And as I say, I really regret not discussing with you, but uh, um, yeah, I'm not sure okay. what to add. Okay. Well, maybe, Very maybe good. one thing, uh, all the best with your project and maybe one day I'll be able to get over and that's, that meet would be, you. A, I'd love it. Be, yeah, yeah. Maybe when we can all meet in person again, we, we'll have you over to have another chat, but thank you so much, um, Sally, again, for joining us tonight. That was Sally Weintraub um, and her book, uh, Psychological Roots of Climate Crisis is out in April and you can order your own copy with a special discount at sallyweintraub.com. Thanks everybody for joining us tonight. Um, we'll be back next week with another speaker, this time from the European Space Agency's Earth Observation and her work in studying glaciers and predicting um, the change in the climate that Sally has been so capably uh, putting a, an emotional context around tonight. So the, all these series are uh, part of the Abbey Leaks Climate Action Project, which is an initiative so, uh, basically created by Creative Leash, uh, Leash County Council and Midland Science in partnership with Abbey Leaks Tidy Towns. And we'll see you next Wednesday at 7pm for another really thought-provoking uh, new approach to uh, climate change. I'm going to stop the live stream now. I'm going to chat with Sally for another few minutes, but unfortunately we have to end the live stream now. So good night, everybody.